Hello, John Serrato here, First Baptist Manchester, coming your way with a devotional that we pray will be a blessing and a help to you. It's uh, from Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul writing to believers in the city of Rome, but it applies to every believer all over, anytime. Uh, the tremendous teaching. Uh, he's sort of winding up all his doctrinal teaching and now becomes very practical. And so we'll look at that beginning with verse 1 of chapter 12 of Romans. If you're sitting at home and you uh, have a Bible handy, maybe you'd like to follow along because we're going to study this passage thoroughly, thoroughly. Okay, so here we go. Um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren... So when he addresses brethren, you know he's talking to believers because believers are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's the way Paul always handles it. So he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, we looked at this last time, but now we want to start over and just get it right from the beginning. And we're going to look at each word. A word study is good. Uh, God gives us the Word of God, and it's clear and beautiful, and, and just a, a, a general reading of it in English is sufficient. But He's also given us teachers and pastor teachers to study the Word, who have the time and uh, hopefully the gifts from the Lord to study the Word. And, and, and He gives us all kinds of tools where brilliant men, brilliant linguists have studied the original language and have it down to a science. It's called textual criticism. It's a beautiful thing and all kinds of books written that just bring out the depths of the meaning of the Greek words, which the New Testament, of course, was written in Greek. So, starting right off, uh, we have we have this um, particular uh, word where, where Paul says, I beseech you. And the word beseech there is like the word beg. Uh, I beg of you. <laughs> now, he's not a beggar, but sometimes we say that. Like, for instance, uh, if, if, if I'm counseling someone and they're on the wrong track, and I really feel it, and I say, look, I beg of you, read the word, pray, seek God's will, I beg of you, see the truth, you know, it, it's not like you're a beggar, but you're, you're pleading with them because you long for them to see what's right, and that's exactly what the apostle here says, I beseech you, I, I beg of you, and then he says, brethren, that's believers, in the light of his mercy, by the mercies of God. In other words, the basis for my pleading with you and, and asking you to do what I'm going to ask you to do is what God has done for you. In the light of God's great love for you. And that's a beautiful uh, verse in uh, Ephesians where the word of God says, uh, he is rich in mercy, God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Uh, believer, we need to see that. I need to see it every day. I, 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 my soul longs to feel that I'm loved by the Lord. And every normal person should feel that way. Not that I'm that normal, but, but every normal person, relatively speaking, should, should, should have that desire in their heart. And especially, of course, if you're a Christian, you have that, that becomes your dominant desire, that, that you just want to know that the Creator God loves you. And it says it so clear, and he cannot lie. The Word of God has stood the test of time. Nobody's ever proven one line of it to be not exactly what it says. Now, I know there's some numerical variations along the line, but that's irrelevant. When it comes to doctrine and teaching, the Word of God is exquisitely accurate. It's beautiful. You can trust the Bible. It's God's, the Creator God's Word to man. And people ignore it, neglect it, reject it. That's beside the point. That doesn't matter. The majority's never been right. <laughs> so here we go. 
So he is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. So when Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, he's, he's appealing to the love behind that mercy. And that's where it begins. God's attitude and God's spirit toward his creation is number one, love, because he is love. The creator God is perfect, holy, pure, spotless love, agape love. And in the Old Testament, it's chesed, and that's a everlasting love, steadfast, unchanging love. That's the nature, that's the essence of the creator. And out of love, he created to share his goodness, his love, his mercy, his blessing, his power, his beauty with his creation. Now, a little tiny fleck of that creation, that's this earth, uh, rebelled and got in trouble. But that's a way God's proving his love. God commendeth, proves his own love toward us in that he came and became one of us in Christ. And God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Reconcile the world. He doesn't need to be reconciled. He's, there's nothing wrong on his end. We need to be reconciled because we just go, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. So get that down. He says, rich in mercy. So Paul says, I beseech you, brother, by the mercies of God, on the basis of his mercy, the great love wherewith he loved us. What do you, what's he asking us to do? I beseech you, therefore, brother, what? What are you begging us to do, Paul? He says that you present your bodies, which means your total selves, your bodies along with your spirit, because your body has a tendency to have a mind of its own. You know that if you've lived any time in this world and tried to live for God, you know, the flesh just, uh, you know, is always there, ready to rise up. And, and so he says here, um, present your bodies a living sacrifice. So you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, the grammar there, and this is where our Greek scholars are such a help. Our, the grammar there is when it, when you, when the way it says present is once and forever. That is decisive. So it's a, it's an, it's an act of submission and sacrifice made once and for all. Ideally, that's the way it is when you get married. Now, these days, you know, it is not always that way, but but it used to be, or at least it's you know, hopefully the ideal is one man, one woman, one lifetime. And and so when they come together, I forsake all others. I give myself totally to you, my bride. And the bride does the same for the husband. There's a commitment, and it's decisive. And, and all intentions at the moment should be for the rest of our lives. So nobody else is going to interfere. It's you and me forever, okay, before the Lord. So so this decisive, and that's the key uh, to that word where it says present. It's a decisive act. But there's, there's, there's something to think about here because we know, even those of us who have done that, and if you've never done it, Maybe you want to think, that's what I really need to do. Make a decisive commitment of my total self to the Lord. You know, th that takes utter, total trust. That's the ultimate faith. And that's the ultimate way you honor God. That's the ultimate, that's the best thing you can do for yourself before God, is to trust Him with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, etc., etc. But, so you make this commitment once and for all. If you've never done it, do it, and God will accept you, and he, things could change. They could get a lot better. Maybe you've been holding out a little bit around the edges. It <laughs> doesn't work. Now, here, we make that commitment. But once you've done that, it's a daily redoing, <laughs> actually, 
I, every morning I get up and I say, Lord, I present myself to you, a living sacrifice. Please accept me through the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood and own me today. So I'll do nothing that's not your will. And unfortunately, I don't always maintain that. I try, but, but we always get blindsided or bushwhacked or something goes wrong, but not always, but often, but less often as you get, as you grow, as you learn, the more you do this, the more God comes to your rescue. We, faith honors God, trust honors God, and God says, them that honor me, I will honor. And that's what a promise, what a promise to be honored by the Lord. So he says, present once and for all, but then every day I think we need to represent ourselves to the Lord just quickly. Lord, I give you myself today. I want to be yours. And then uh, a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. Now, Paul here is, he's been talking to the Jewish people, and all the Jewish people were very familiar with sacrifices because that was their religion. It was all about sacrifices. It was all about uh, killing lambs and goats and bulls and birds and whatever you could afford. If you sinned, you made your sacrifice, an animal sacrifice. God did that to show people that sin brings forth death. Something's got to die when when people sin against God. Something's going to die. It may not be physical. It may be just it may be emotional, spiritual, relational. Sin kills no matter what. Just keep that in mind. It's a good reason to plead with God to keep you from sin. But anyway, he says, a living sacrifice. And, and so God doesn't want us dead. Jesus died once and for all for us. Nobody, we never have to die again. And Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will never see death. Boy, how could anybody say such a thing unless it was God and it was true? And that's exactly the way it was. It was the Lord God himself, Jesus, in Jesus, saying, if you believe in me, surrender to me, give me your heart. Let me give you a new heart. You will never die. You say, well, what happens when my body dies? Well, that's your body, but that's not you. You, absent from the body, present with the Lord in a, in a, in a timeless moment, in this twinkling of an eye, you're in his presence where there's fullness of joy and pleasures at his right hand forever. So, so we, we are a living sacrifice. We don't have to die. We, 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 the only way we die is to have our old sinful ways die. That's what it means to be crucified with Christ. You, you, you pronounce death on the old sinful ways. You pronounce death on your lust and pride and, and anger and, and envy and, uh, uh, you know, greed and all those horrible things that the, the flesh is heir to. That's why it's got to be a sacrifice, got to be crucified. Now, the picture here is what happened in the Old Testament. When something was given as a sacrifice to God, it was called devoted. The Hebrew word translated to English is devoted, and it means devoted to destruction. This strong stuff. The sacrifice was devoted to destruction. The cities that hated God, rebelled against God, wanted to destroy God's people, were devoted to destruction. The people devoted to, de it's horrible, but that's man's choice. And, and God offers grace, mercy, grace, mercy, and we po people continue to reject it. There's nothing left, and it's de destruction. So, that, But the idea is that devoted to destruction means it's done for. You give it up, it's gone forever, total and utter destruction. So then that's, that's the picture of our sinful life. We have new life, new life in Christ, new beautiful life, uh, hopefully producing the love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness and self-control that, that the Holy Spirit can help us develop in our lives, beautiful to be like Jesus. So the old way, we don't want that. It gets in the way. The sin, the lust, the pride, the self, the, the anger, the, 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 the fear, all those negatives, God wants those to die. He wants them out of your life, crucified with Christ. 
that the old man is crucified the old way. So, so he says, you're his living sacrifice and acceptable unto God. So you present yourself acceptable. How can I ever be as I am knowing myself and my past and probably so my future and my present? How can I ever feel like I'm acceptable with a holy, pure, perfect, infinite God? Well, because Jesus took away all that failure, nailed it to the cross, and gives me his perfect righteousness. So I can present myself to him acceptable, acceptable. So dedicate your bodies, a living sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. That's what it means. So that means my life should, my life goal every day, my dominant desire should be to please the Lord. And, and, and we don't go crazy with it and go fanatical, but we, we really, that's what we want. Everything we do is judged on the light of does it please the Lord. And, and that's the way our life should be. So we, we present our bodies a living sacrifice, acceptable, acceptable to him, which means pleasing to him. And it is your reasonable service. Now we're going to end with this thought reasonable service. Now, in the original, that alludes to the Old Testament worship when they brought a sacrifice to the temple or the tabernacle, then the temple or wherever. You bring a sacrifice and, and what you're doing is you are um, uh, presenting your, yourself in a, a worshipful way. And reasonable service you, there's two ways to look at that, so we take them both. <laughs> That's the way I do it. When there's when there's a scripture that can be taken two ways, and both ways are obviously good and right and true and don't contradict any other scripture, maybe two different ways, I just take them both. Uh, and I'm not sure which one Paul had in mind, but it doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit supersedes and gives us a message. He speaks to us directly through the Word. So, so the, the, the two ways of looking at this living sacrifice, reasonable service is, reasonable means rational. It means logical. In fact, the, the, the Greek word itself is logistos, logistos, and it, it, it's from logic. It's logical. So what Paul's saying, it's only rational in the light of God's mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, what he paid for us in coming and taking our sin. In the light of that, it's only reasonable to give yourself totally back to him. And that's the object. It, the best thing for you is to give yourself totally to him. That's what Jesus did, and that's what we're to do. And it's the best thing for time and eternity to give yourself totally to him. And, and so that's your reasonable service. It's irrational, and we'll look at this some more next time. It's irrational not to give yourself to the Lord. I mean, if you don't give yourself to the Lord, you give yourself to a dozen other things, and none of those are going to last, and some of them can be harmful. So giving yourself to God is the best thing you can do. It's reasonable. But it also is, in the original, it can mean spiritual worship. It's your spiritual worship, which is what was supposed to happen when somebody brought a sacrifice to the Old Testament priest, and, and they were given a spiritual worship, confessing their sin and asking the Lord to forgive them and offering the sacrifice to see, to show that they realize that what they did deserved death. Uh, any sin deserves his death, uh, but we don't get into all that. But the point is, reasonable service, act of worship, only sensible to give yourself totally to the Lord. we got so much more to say about this scripture. We'll do it next time. Lord, I ask you to bless this word to every heart, please. Anyone who's listened today, may they be blessed and strengthened and give them the deepest dominant desire to give themselves totally to you as a living sacrifice that you may raise them up in life and joy and power. In Jesus' name, amen.